Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. So um, I'm a little bit of a theater nerd. So Ooh. yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the production that's going on right now is being directed by Billy Porter, which is kind of amazing, right? Um, and so at some point, Billy Porter was standing here telling people what to do, and now I'm going to stand here and tell you guys what to do. So that's pretty awesome. Um, I feel like I should have a giant hat or a long flowing gown, but I'll make do without. Um, my name is Jeremy Hayes. I'm a DevOps engineer with Leatrio. And today I want to talk with you about creating a culture of inclusion. And doesn't that just sound really nice, sort of like world peace or free donuts? <laughs> and there are lots of reasons that this is important to me personally. In my past lives, I've been a queer activist, a social justice educator, an out gay man, and really just somebody who cares about humanity. But then I became a father. And now these two little darlings drive basically everything that I do, in addition to driving me crazy. But they have me thinking about what can I be doing to make the world a better and a safer place for them? Because let's face it, we live in a world where people are treated differently because of who they are and how they look. Some people like to say that we live in a colorblind society or that we've moved beyond seeing race. But often the people who are saying that are not the people who experience racism on a daily basis. And we've all seen headlines about how tech has a diversity problem. Many of us in the room have probably felt it ourselves in one way or another. Whether you've personally experienced discrimination or feeling left out, or you've just looked around your organization and noticed everybody here looks just like me. Or conversely, nobody looks like me. According to research from Glassdoor, 67% of job seekers consider workplace diversity as an important factor when they're looking at job opportunities. And more than 50% of current employees want their workplace to do more to foster diversity. What we know is that just getting more people in the room with different characteristics isn't enough. It's a start, don't get me wrong, but we need to take a hard look at the culture and what we're doing or not doing to be truly inclusive. When I talk about a culture of inclusion, I mean a place where organizational customs, beliefs, and actions truly and honor and welcome all individuals. Where factors like race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, mental health, body shape and size, religion, ethnic and cultural background, socioeconomic status, all of these things don't prevent someone from being fully involved. A place where people are not just invited in, but truly made a part of the culture. So today, I want to suggest some things that you can do to help create that culture in your own organizations. The first thing is just to be yourself. You are valuable. You bring a unique set of talents and perspectives to your organization. And you should feel comfortable bringing all the aspects of your identity to work with you. When we are our whole authentic selves, we make it easier for others around us to do the same. If we're going to truly value difference, we have to make it visible. And when our culture is truly inclusive, the parts of our identity that make us unique become common and ordinary rather than strange or exotic. For example, I talk about my husband in casual conversation just as much as my coworkers talk about their opposite sex partners. It should be completely normal to ask for an adjusted work schedule because you're fasting during Ramadan. We all need to feel comfortable expressing ourselves to feel safe and included. I was recently attending HashiConf uh, earlier this month, and I heard a HashiCore engineer there talk about how he unintentionally created a movement within the organization that led to the creation of pride stickers and other swag just because he asked for it. He wanted to be visible as a queer person in tech, and by doing so, he created a space that made it easier for others to be visible as well. It's not always easy, especially if you feel like, if you feel like you're the only person like you. But sometimes I think you'll be surprised what you'll find when you ask. On the other hand, if you work at an organization that doesn't respect you for who you are, 
Try to find allies within the organization who can help you bring about the change necessary to create a more inclusive culture. If that doesn't work, it might be time to look for a different organization that will show you the respect you deserve. Now, for some of us, that's easier said than done. I know that I'm speaking from a place of privilege as a cis white male, pretty established in my career, and not everybody can take those kinds of risks. The second thing you can do is be mindful of the words you use every day. I'm not talking about political correctness. I'm talking about being aware of the language that you use and how it impacts the people around you. For starters, try using gender neutral terms. I have a coworker from California who calls everybody dude or bro. Basically, every sentence either starts with dude or ends in bro. It's just what they do in California, right? But he's trying really hard to change. But like any other habit, it's hard to break. Or take my husband, for example. He talks about the fact that his father, and I'm sure many of other, other people's fathers did the same thing, taught him that it's polite to call a group of women ladies. Hello, ladies, how are you today? But that can be perceived as diminutive or condescending. And you also don't know if everybody that you perceive as a lady actually identifies that way. There are lots of alternatives, and it takes practice. I encourage you to try it out this week and give yourself permission to make mistakes because that's what matters, the trying. That's what signals, hey, I get it and I'm working on being inclusive. It's not about being perfect and always getting it right. And it's perfectly okay to stop and correct yourself mid-sentence. Even that opens up the opportunity for further dialogue. And I can't talk about gender inclusive language without mentioning pronouns. With singer Sam Smith recently announcing their pronouns, it's a bit of a hot topic right now. We need to respect how people choose to identify. And this is just another opportunity to make things more visible. I've started including my pronouns in my email signature, my Twitter bio. When everyone is explicit about their pronouns, including the people whose gender is not typically called into question, it actually makes it more comfortable for someone who identifies as non-binary or whose presentation may not match their pronouns. It makes it easier for them to self-identify and ask to be called what they want to be called. The third thing you can do is get to know people as individuals and treat them as such. Each of you is a complete complex person with a multifaceted identity, and so are all your coworkers. Try not to rely on stereotypes based on someone's appearance or background, or let those determine how you interact with them. At the end of the day, we're all individuals with our own unique blend of nature and nurture that governs how our personalities manifest. When we start treating people differently or excluding them, we miss out on the value that they bring to our organizations. A good friend of mine, Vernon Wall, who's a diversity trainer, talks about the tape recorder that plays in our heads. Now, for you young people in the room who might not know what this is, <laughs> think a Spotify playlist. These are all the messages that we picked up when we were growing up, from our families, our school, our church, wherever. They're all the things that you noticed, even subconsciously. Maybe it was noticing how people were treated differently based on how they looked or where they were from, or even explicit messages like, this group of people is lazy or women belong in the kitchen. All of these messages are recorded on the track in your head and it's constantly playing in the background, whether you know it or not. So now when you see someone who looks a certain way walking down the street, without thinking about it, you're calling on those messages and making assumptions. That's called unconscious bias. It's very hard to undo that old programming because it's often rooted in fears, superstitions, and ignorance. And usually, the people we got it from were the people we grew up trusting the most. My husband talks about his mother who basically has a contention that anyone who doesn't love animals is evil, and you can't trust men who wear pinky rings. These are both silly things, right? But that, the, those, those assumptions are always there. But you can undo this too. It requires a lot of self-awareness. 
One thing that can be helpful is to ask your colleagues and your friends, people that you trust, what they think your biases are. Having open and honest conversations about the biases that other people see us displaying can make us aware of our blind spots and open up further conversation. This is something else you can try this week. Try to notice when you're making an assumption about someone you don't know and think about where is that coming from? What are the messages that are playing in your head? According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, about one in five adults in the US experience mental illness in a given year. Some mental illnesses are more debilitating than others, but the reality is that most of us will be impacted by our own mental health at some point in our lives. This can include illnesses like depression or anxiety or neurodevelopmental disorders like learning disorders or autism. The fourth thing you can do is practice empathy and compassion with, with your coworkers who might be struggling with any of these issues. For most of us, our jobs are stressful, but it's usually a positive stress that challenges us to get better at our work. But we have to understand that everyone comes with different experiences and, and needs. For me, standing up here and doing public speaking is stressful. I mean, just check my heart rate monitor. But for someone with anxiety, it can be really hard, almost impossible. James Meikle, who spoke earlier today, also did a really great talk about this last year um, with some great strategies about mental health. And there's a link to the recording of that in my slides that you can download later. The Open Sourcing Mental Illness is also a great resource to learn more about mental health and tech. And they have lots of uh, videos and resources on their website. Talking openly about mental health can help to reduce the stigma around it and contribute to a more inclusive culture. I'll tell pretty much anybody who will listen that between my husband and I, we see two individual therapists and a couples therapist every month. The CEO of my company talks about he and his wife's therapy and, and likens it to getting an oil change, to something you have to do. Be sure to take the time for self-care. We all know that burnout is a real thing. If your company allows for mental health days or has unlimited PTO, take advantage of that time when you need it and be as, com as open as you feel comfortable with your supervisor about what your needs are. Fifth, pay attention to the people in your organization whose voices and perspectives are marginalized. It's probably not even intentional. How often have you been sitting in a room in a meeting and one of the dudes presents some idea, to, I'm sorry, one of the women in the group presents an idea and two minutes later, some dude says, the same thing, right? And they're like, oh yeah, you're a genius. This happens all the time, right? Those of us with privilege have a responsibility to take notice and do something about it. So the next time that female colleague speaks up, chime in and say, hey, that sounds really interesting. Tell us more before somebody else can preempt her. We can't expect someone who's being marginalized to always be able to advocate for themselves. If you have colleagues who you think might not be feeling included, check in with them and see how they're doing. It's important to have a working environment that's accessible to individuals with physical disabilities, but creating a welcoming space goes further than that. Go beyond thinking about accommodation and instead look at inclusive design, which focuses on making environments universally accessible and goes beyond disability. Taylor and Joanne from Perkins Access spoke this morning about how to make our products more accessible and how we need to hire more people with disabilities. But we also need to look inside our organizations. Think about someone with different needs from yours, what they might need, and make that the norm rather than the exception that they have to request. That not only helps the person who might need that accommodation, it's also a clear signal of inclusion. Make your slide decks and websites that are easy to read by people with low vision. Provide trainings in a variety of modes for people with different learning styles. And it's not just about disabilities. Encourage your company to have lactation rooms, nap rooms, prayer meditation rooms to make sure that your space is welcoming for everybody. The goal is to make sure that everyone is able to fully participate. I was recently at another conference and when they were announcing lunch, it was like, we have this great chicken sandwich on a wrap, and then we have the roast beef on brioche, and it's great. And then we have some vegetarian thing. 
Later in the day, I was speaking with a, another attendee who had the vegetarian option, and she said she should have known from the dismissive way they talked about it that it was pretty lackluster. It was an afterthought. And you can tell that she wasn't feeling very included. If you're involved in the hiring process in your organization, take a critical look at your processes. How diverse are the individuals in your candidate pool? How can you actively reach out to candidates that have traditionally been underrepresent, underrepresented? Find organizations like the Resilient Coders we, we heard from this morning. Talk to them and hire their amazing engineers. Remember that unconscious bias we talked about before? Be especially mindful about it in your interview process. For example, research indicates that those with ethnic sounding names in Western countries are less likely to even be selected for an interview than those with Western sounding names. Notice when you're treating candidates differently based on their identity. If you see a female candidate and a male candidate exhibit the same behavior, do you treat them differently? Make sure that your evaluation criteria are objective and consider anti-bias training for your recruiting teams and hiring managers. And then after hiring, make sure that you have clear objectives and explicit criteria for promotions and reviews. This morning, we had a chat with folks from traditionally underrepresented groups in tech, and one of the things we touched on was just that, how a lack of clearly defined expectations and SMART goals makes it really easy for unconscious bias to sneak in. At all of these uh, DevOps Days conferences, we have codes of conduct that call out what behavior is acceptable and what isn't. Encourage your organization to have one for itself and be public with it. People who have experienced harassment or fear experiencing harassment are more likely to join your organization if they feel it's gonna be a safe place for them or harassment won't be tolerated. The 2018 Women in the Workplace report found that only 27% of employees say that managers regularly challenge biased language and behavior when they observe it. Only 40% say that disrespectful behavior toward women is quickly addressed, and just 32% think their company swiftly acts on claims of sexual harassment. But it's not just sexual harassment we need to be aware of. Don't tolerate jokes about mental disorders or biased language about women, racial groups, LGBT people, anything. When you see behavior that's inappropriate or disrespectful, speak up. Change won't come if we're all silent. Finally, take the time to learn about the experiences of people who are different from you. Look for books, podcasts, blog posts from a variety of perspectives. The uploaded slides from this presentation have links from some suggested resources that you can check out as a starting point. I was just reading a thread on Twitter earlier this month about how to be less of a, quote, clueless white person without asking people of color to do the work of educating you. And the suggestion was, go right now, follow 50 people of color on social media, and just listen. Don't comment, don't even retweet it, just listen. And you can do this with any identity that's different from yours. So that's it, we've solved the problem, right? Seriously, these are my ideas of what you can do today to help your organization and yourself be more inclusive. I hope you took away something that you think can be helpful. And remember, this is a journey that we're all on together and none of us are perfect or have all the answers. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Please check out this link, give me your feedback, download the slides. If you don't get the Pearl Jam reference in the URL, I can't help you. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Enjoy the rest of your conference. If you'd like to talk more about it, please find me in the hallway. Thank you.